Okay, good morning. Welcome. My name is Lance Beck and I am President and CEO of the Greater Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's call. Uh, allow me to get us started today as we do have a full program, uh, lots of great information and stories to share here. So uh, I want to start off this morning by acknowledging our partners at the Greater Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce. Our investor partner is Modern Electric Water Company. Our visionary partners are Enliant Employee Benefits, uh, BNSF Railways, Multicare Valley Hospital, Providence Healthcare, Spokane International Airport, STCU, and Waste Management. Additionally, I wanna thank our corporate level partners shown here on the screen. Thank you to those partners. And of course, our community partners, the City of Liberty Lake and the City of Spokane Valley. Uh, at this time, it's a privilege for me to welcome uh, all those members joining us today. Uh, we are thrilled that you can join us here today uh, for this call. The Greater Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce has been impacted this year, much like many of your businesses. And uh, as a member dues supported organization, uh, it is critical for us uh, that your support uh, makes it possible for us to continue to work on your behalf. So we thank you. Uh, for continuing to invest in the in the chamber and the work we do uh, working towards economic recovery and growth here within the greater Spokane Valley. Um, right now I'd like to pivot over to acknowledging our sponsors that made today's event possible. Um, with us today we have BNSF Railways. Um, unfortunately they are unable to be here on the call today so uh, I wanted to acknowledge them and um, and let you know on, on behalf of them and their many years of supporting the chamber, BNSF uh, continues to be a critical link for our consumers with the global marketplace here uh, in the greater Spokane region. Uh, for over 170 years, they've played a vital role in building and sustaining the nation's economy. They strive to maintain a strong relationship with the communities where their employees live. Uh, BNSF's heritage has played a critical role in setting up and growing the American West. And today they continue to have a significant impact in meeting the needs of shippers and industry in our economy here. Uh, I truly appreciate the partnership with BNSF and their continued work with our transportation coalition here locally, uh, helping make our system the safest and most efficient network possible. Um, for our second underwriting sponsor today, we have Ide Bailey with us. Uh, with us today, we have Scott LaPlante and Adam Hannell. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Scott to the mic. Thanks, Lance. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm uh, Scott LaPlante, an auto partner at uh, I Bailey here in Spokane. Uh, I Bailey, a, a CPA and consulting firm. Um, and I just want to pass it off to um, to Adam here, a, a, a senior manager in our technology consulting group. Um, he's going to discuss some, some technology opportunities in manufacturing. So it's our pleasure to support the Valley Chamber in the manufacturing community. And I'll pass it off to Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And I'm going to share my screen here. Please let me know if and when you can see that and I will move forward. Looks good to go, Adam. All right, thank you. Well, a little bit about me. I'm gonna just move it on from this uh, professional slide here to a little bit more of a personal slide about myself. I'm Adam Hanel. I'm actually just over the divide from you here in Billings, Montana. <clears throat> excuse me, a couple pictures of my family here. We enjoy the outdoors. In fact, we spent quite a few weeks in Spokane over the last few summers. As you can see here, my son plays uh, travel baseball and we've spent uh, several weeks there in Spokane for uh, baseball tournaments. Love the place. Uh, it's, it's always been very welcoming and we enjoy getting over there. Uh, the competition is always great. So um, hopefully if anybody's joining this has uh, kids in that, I appreciate Appreciate the interactions with everybody there. <clears throat> I've been in our technology consulting group here at iBailey for uh, almost 12 years now. The first half of that 12 years was spent guiding our clients, uh, helping them with how to run their server and network infrastructure. Uh, today, I'm gonna tell you about one of those services that Scott had listed on his slide, and that was that is our data analytics group. Um, as my role became more consultative here at iBailey, I noticed that uh, despite the ever growing number of systems and vast amounts of data that each client had, uh, very few of them were actually leveraging that data beyond maybe the last one to 12 months to drive any success within their business. 
Uh, most were simply accumulating transactions because that's what they had to do. Uh, data analytics has always been something that's kind of been at the back of, of most places' minds. Uh, some were, were really using it to drive change, but uh, especially now in these times, uh, 2020, uh, it's really become a differentiator in uh, success. And that's what, uh, what uh, eventually led me into our analytics group was, was really trying to help our clients leverage their data better. Um, I'm gonna switch slides here and show you uh, Gartner's analytics maturity model. Uh, one of the first clients that, that I had the opportunity to work on um, has gone on to realize the potential of their data and has benefited it for many years. Uh, they manufacture asphalt, a little different than maybe some of the topics we're talking about today, but uh, manufacturing nonetheless. Uh, like many of you, their sales preceded their product, um, often by many months, uh, six, eight, ten months, and in, in, in sometimes. Um, within that time span, many factors could influence their margin once that contract was fulfilled. Oil prices, resource availability, uh, chemical composition, staffing, weather, uh, even the truck that's transporting the finished product. Um, so what we did is we helped them collect data from all their systems, and then we augmented it with data that's publicly available. Um, and they've been able to climb this analytics maturity model that you see here. Uh, they started out by examining the entire history of their sales. This gave them a solid understanding of what had happened. Um, and it gave them a certain expectation of what should happen in the next year. Uh, next, we brought in historical crude oil prices from a variety of different suppliers. Uh, this gave us some insight into why margin was maybe higher or lower than expected. Uh, then they understood uh, that, that next level of why things happened. And it opened the door for us to better detail what will happen based on today's data. And unfortunately, we don't have a model for what will happen in an election year and also having a pandemic, but I can guarantee you that next time that happens, we'll have some pretty good data um, to have some predictive models around that for them. Um, I could go on and on for the next hour or so discussing some different data that we use for this, visuals that were created, uh, the different audiences that we targeted, but um, I'd like to just touch real quickly on our process for implementing a successful analytics project. On the left side of this slide, and, and there's maybe some terminology here that you might not be familiar with, that's okay. Um, on the left side of this slide, we have our various systems represented that we extract data from. Think of that as your ERP, uh, you know, your, your main financial or, or systems that you have at your company. The right hand side of this slide, we have a lot of the more common visualization tools on the market right now. Um, and the landscape on both of this slide change. ERP systems are updated, they're replaced. Those visualization tools we see on the right-hand side, they get updated monthly and replaced. It, 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 there's always competition for the, the cutting edge of that. Those change quite a bit. What we found is almost any time those systems were updated or changed, it was like hitting the reset button on any analytics efforts um, that had been done at that time. Really, really troublesome. Um, where we find success here at iBailey is uh, by leveraging uh, data lakes and data warehouses. We're able to store data from a variety of systems, even legacy ones, especially if you're going from one system or another, or if you've had an update, we can store that, that data from legacy systems and then build relationships within that data warehouse that allow us to have continuous reporting no matter what changes happen on either side of this slide. Um, I did maybe get a little, little technical. I get really passionate about data analytics here at iBailey. It's a lot of fun uh, for me to work into. Uh, it's been a real high level. Um, appreciate the opportunity to share some of that with you. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions or you'd like to discuss this more, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to, uh, love to talk about it. Thank you. Lance, you should have control back there. Awesome, thanks, Adam, and thank you, yeah. Ike Bailey, for the support of this program. 
uh, we're, we're thrilled to have a partner like you on board and, and your support continues to um, be an instrumental agent for the chamber here. Um, let me know when we've got it. There we go. Okay, so our next underwriting partner is Modern Electric Water Company. Um, Modern Electric has graciously offered to let us have this time to speak a little bit about our uh, Spokane Valley Chamber Foundation. And so um, thank you to Modern for this opportunity. Uh, the Spokane Valley Chamber Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, committed to enhancing community development through the creation of sponsorship of scholarships and leadership development for educational programs. The foundation proudly funds scholarships annually for students seeking career technical education. Uh, that's remained our focus over the last five years. Uh, students applying for two-year vocational trade programs at trade schools locally have opportunities for financial support through the Spokane Valley Chamber Foundation. The combined need-based and merit-based scholarship program has been cultivated over the years uh, to support students in the greater Spokane Valley region. Uh, we are thrilled to say that to date for 2020, we've awarded over $37,000 in scholarships for CTE education here locally. Uh, this continues to remain possible uh, through local donations. And so if you're interested in learning more about how you can support uh, the foundation and the scholarship arm of the chamber here, uh, please do reach out to us. We can make sure that we can get you the information on how you can continue to help make uh, those education goals for local students a reality. Um, at this time, thank you again to Modern Electric for support of this program and for being a relentless champion of the Valley Chamber uh, in many ways over. Uh, thank you to Joe, uh, his staff, his board at Modern for continuing to make uh, the Chamber uh, viable. Speaking of students and career pathways, this brings me to the moment where I'd like to pivot to our final underwriting sponsor. We have Kevin Brockbank on the line today from uh, Spokane Community College. And so I'd like to turn it over to Kevin for a few words. Yeah, thanks Lance. So like Lance said, I'm Kevin Brockbank. I'm the president here at Spokane Community College. I'm really happy to be part of the event this morning and also Spokane Valley Chamber just because we so highly value our role in the manufacturing and other sectors of the Spokane region. Um, uh, have some unique times going on right now. So I wanna take a minute to just kind of tell you what's happening at SCC and how we're fulfilling that role as a workforce partner under some different circumstances. Uh, as many of you know, the high majority of our programs that we um, deliver require hands-on instruction to develop high-level skills uh, needed into the workforce. And whether that's in manufacturing or allied health or IT, um, during the COVID pandemic, those have been tremendously challenging um, goals to meet. Uh, but since May 5th, we have actually led the state in bringing those programs back for in-person instruction. As an example of that, I can tell you that this fall, we have over 800 classes on campus serving nearly 4,000 students. Um, and we're doing that because we realize that that's a, a critical role for our region, as well as serving our students. So we're doing everything we can to stay open and, and make that happen. Um, as well as just kind of keeping the doors open, we're pushing forward on some other workforce development uh, initiatives. And the leader in that for us is our Running Start for Careers program. And for those of you who have not heard about that, that's our work that we're doing uh, with some of our local school districts to uh, provide students in those participating districts the option to use the Running Start legislation to pursue career and technical ed uh, degrees. So. If a student knows they want to be a machinist and they're a junior, they can come here under the Running Start program, get their machinist degree and their high school diploma at the same time, in the same way that that option has been open for transfer students for so many years. So we're incredibly excited about that and looking for some support for some of those students who need money for professional tools and we'll be kind of working with the, our region on that. So. Once again, we're working our hardest just to make sure that we continue to serve our students and continue to serve our local employers and economy in the workforce development region. And we're just happy to be a part of the event today and hoping this is a productive morning. So thanks Lance for the opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for obviously the leadership within that CTE education sector that, that Spokane Community College has, has been providing uh, such a great access for our students to have that program here. 
uh, locally and uh, ability for different pathways uh, outside the normal education tracks that we can get them into right here down the road. So uh, thank you again for your guys' partnership and commitment to that. Um, at this time, we're going to pivot over. I'd like to introduce our panel uh, of speakers today. We have an incredible lineup um, for this event. And so uh, with us today, we have Paul Bucklin, uh, Forest Resource Manager at Inland Empire Paper Company, uh, Russ Voggen, Founder and CEO of Voggen Timbers, Quinn Holt, Project Manager with Baker Construction and Development, Inc., and Andy Barrett. Um, Andy, I, the titles go long and wide. So Toolbox Northwest, Blockhouse Life, uh, Bird Companies, uh, all around entrepreneur. I'm excited for everybody to get a chance to hear from uh, these individuals. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul to kick us off here. And so Paul, you have the honor of being first up. All right, uh, I've unmuted. Uh, do you hear me, Lance? Loud and clear. Okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll get started and uh, uh, try to make it short and succinct because, as you can see from my background, the weather is nice and the fish are biting. So, um, uh, thanks for inter uh, uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, as as you said, I'm the forest resource manager for Inland Empire Paper Company. A uh, little. CV about myself. I went to the University of Montana and got my bachelor's of science in forest management. Uh, prior to coming to IEP, I worked with the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Montana State Parks, Weyerhaeuser, Mount St. Helens Tree Farm, and as a forestry consultant in Portland, cruising timber all over the Northwest. So uh, I came to IEP as a field forester 23 years, five months, 17 days, and three hours ago, approximately. Um, for a forester uh, working for IEP is a dream job. Uh, in my experience, few companies have such a long term commitment to uh, managing uh, the resource. So, uh, some quick stats about IEP. <coughs> We have been making paper here in Millwood since 1911. So for you math whizzes out there, that's a thousand and ninety years of continuous operation. A hundred and nine years of continuous operation uh, here in Millwood. And for most of that, it's uh, been privately owned by the Coles family. Uh, for most of that history. So, and uh, we started purchasing timberland in 1952, and we've been building that land base ever since. Uh, we now currently own and manage over 120,000 acres, uh, ranging from Northport, Washington, which is next to the Canadian border, down to Kuski, Idaho, uh, the largest block being in and around uh, uh, Mount Spokane. Spirit Lake, Twin Lakes, which is about half of our ownership. Um, fun fact, uh, we have a 100 year harvest plan for the entire forest. Uh, so with that, we are very comfortable that we can sustainably harvest 32 million board feet per year uh, for that entire length. Uh, that's uh, approximately 4,300, that's enough timber would produce enough lumber to produce or build 4,300 single family houses. Uh, we also plant uh, about 750,000 seedlings a year, uh, many different uh, species, uh, Western Larch, Ponderosa Pine, White Pine, Douglas Fir, Cedar, Lodgepole, Spruce, uh, pretty, much, pretty much all of them that, that grow here. Um, so I'd like to give you uh, uh, sort of a, a pathway of uh, the logs to paper and some of the other byproducts along the way. Uh, so when we're managing the forest, we sell various raw timber products to local mills. Those are big logs, small logs, pine logs, fir logs, uh, all different sizes and, and shapes to the various local mills such as Idaho Forest Group, Stimson Lumber, and even Russ's family business, Boggan Brothers Lumber up in Colville. And they make, th these sawmills take 
uh, our round products, the, the, the logs, and make square products, which is the lumber. And in that process, they produce multiple byproducts, the chips, sawdust, and, and even bark. And then from there, more, by, more finished products are made, paper, particle board, mulch, and electricity. So, you know, 70% of the paper that Inland Empire Paper Company makes comes from these byproducts from the sawmills, the, the chips. Uh, the remainder of uh, the, the fiber comes from recycled uh, paper. So to dispel a myth more explicitly, we do not grind up whole trees, big, large trees to make paper. Uh, you know, each of the businesses that participate in this whole supply chain from raw resource to byproducts to finished products supports jobs and the economy beyond just logs and, and lumber. Uh, the, you know, our, our supply chain here in this region is very uh, robust, and, robust and fully integrated. Um, in fact, the supply chain is, is pretty compact and efficient. So for instance, uh, logs uh, harvested in Mount Spokane Spirit Lake area are trucked 15 to 20 miles to uh, a sawmill in Chilco, Idaho, the, the Idaho Forest Group mill. And then they make lumber there. And then those chips then get trucked uh, 25 to 30 miles to our facility here in Millwood. That's, that's a 40 to 50 mile trip uh, total from raw product to multiple byproducts and, and finished products. Uh, that's, that's just a very compact uh, uh, system. So uh, consider uh, a typical Spokaneite or Coeur d'Alene resident that uh, works at a job and pays their taxes here and they build a home with contractors that live and work here and the contractor uses wood that is grown and processed here. And home, uh, the homeowner sits in their living room and reads the spokesman review that was printed here and on paper that was grown and processed and recycled here. And that same homeowner uh, recreates with their family cutting firewood or hunting or skiing on working timberlands that are here. So, you know, we are living in a functioning circular economy that is the very model of, of sustainability. Uh, the more our money circulates uh, within our own community, the more we're insulated from uh, whatever happens in, in markets uh, and in uh, far off countries. It, it, it allows us to be or helps us to be economically resilient. Um, to switch gears a little bit, I, I'd like to uh, talk about the forest resource that we manage and how the market context has evolved over the years. So uh, 30 to 40 years ago, um, there were more, albeit smaller, sawmills in the region that processed larger logs that typically came from the National Forest System, uh, you know, the National Forest Timber Sale uh, Program. So as the timber sale program was drastically reduced in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, uh, mills, regional mills needed to retool to efficiently process smaller logs that primarily came from uh, private and state lands. And, and uh, Russ Boggan's family were early innovators with their sawmill there in, in Colville. So the lumber from these smaller logs can then be put back together, so to speak, to make engineered structural lumber like eye joists, blue lamb beams, and cross laminated timbers that have replaced the large beams that were cut from large logs of yesteryear. And, you know, Russ is going to tell us more about this later, but the point is, is that uh, the relative value of these small logs has added value to private property and timberlands. So, uh, in the paper market, uh, we've been focusing on producing specialty grades of paper instead of strictly newsprint. Uh, these specialty grades include fast food tray liners, uh, book stock, advertising papers, bag stock for 
quick service restaurant market and 100% recycled packaging papers. Of course, we still make the finest newsprint in the world, but specialty paper markets help diversify the portfolio of, of our product line. So uh, in managing a forest, uh, there, are, there have been some significant changes and changes in perspective uh, over time. Uh, in, instead of simply managing the forest for solid wood products, we view the forest as a portfolio of uh, amenities uh, or values. Um, logs are still a primary value, of course, but we also manage for recreation, wildlife habitat, clean water, and importantly, uh, in, we engage with our community around us. Uh, it's our view that the best way for a community to this full suite of values is to keep the working forest working. So if a forest is converted to some other use, uh, those values are diminished or, or eliminated. Um, the urban sprawl is uh, into the wildland urban interface. Uh, for those of you who love acronyms, that's the WUI. Uh, it, that's the main threat of forest lost. Uh, uh, landowners are uh, of intact forests are increasingly under extreme pressure to sell or subdivide uh, their property into ranchettes. And when that happens, public recreation ends. Wildlife habitat is fragmented and degraded. Water quality deteriorates and forest and fuels management is nearly eliminated. In short, uh, long-term active forest management is the highest form of conservation that will keep our community safe and healthy, particularly in an area of, uh, in an era of megafires. Uh, let me show you a, a real-life example of this. And, and Lance, if you can bring up uh, the photos that I sent you. Okay. Um, uh, well, the, the, this year, uh, on Labor Day, uh, some high winds drove a wildfire straight at the small town of Blanchard. Uh, oh, yes, it did ruin my Labor Day holiday. Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> this wildfire uh, was headed straight at the, the town of Blanchard. Uh, Inland Paper owns 240 acres in the immediately adjacent to Blanchard with Highway 41 and Stone Road uh, forming our south and west boundaries. Uh, so in 1996, so we're going back 23, 24 years, uh, we harvested some uh, suppressed uh, small trees and we left the larger dominant ponderosa, pon ponderosa pine. And then we followed that with a prescribed burn in the spring of 1997 uh, to reduce the fuels. This also allows the trees that we left uh, to grow faster and, and bigger uh, because there's only a finite amount of resources that, that trees can use. Unfortunately, we don't have any pictures from 1997 because we didn't have, not everyone had a camera in their pocket at, in those days. But uh, this first picture that you're looking at is a corner. It is actually a corner of our property that did not get uh, harvest or uh, did not get burnt this this Labor Day. Uh, some things that you should notice is that the the openness of the stand, uh, the low vegetation. And if you look at the base of some of the trees in the foreground, you can still see a little bit of char from that uh, on the bark uh, from the broadcast burn that we did or the prescribed fire that we executed 20, 23 years ago. Uh, so if you click the next picture, Lance. All right, uh, what you see here is a picture of some uh, adjacent property that had been untreated. Um, you, you'll notice the tightness of the stand, uh, the continuity of the fuels from ground to crown, and the 100% mortality. Uh, the, 
the point of this picture is uh, that this forest condition uh, is very common on many ownerships and is very treatable. Next picture, Lance. All right, so uh, when the fire came through uh, on, on Labor Day, uh, it was a crown fire on uh, before it got to our property. And it was, uh, you know, we had high winds that day, uh, 30, 40 mile an hour gusts. Um, this is a picture of the post wildfire of the area that we treated 23 years ago. What I'd like to point your attention to is uh, notice the low level of scorching on the vegetation also. So, you know, that bottom, oh, 10 feet or 10 feet and under uh, might have gotten scorched, but pretty much all of those uh, trees uh, that you see are live and have live, healthy crowns. Um, these trees, again, were able to grow faster with th thicker bark and more resilient to wildfire when it did come. So if you advance the next slide, Lance. So this is a picture of uh, in the far right, bottom right, uh, you'll see stone where stone road uh, junctions with highway 41. You know, at this point, the fire had dropped to the ground and had maybe five to eight foot flame lengths, uh, not 200 foot flame lengths. Uh, the, it was had dropped to the ground because of the spacing of, of the trees. Firefighters were able to gain control of the fire and reduce its spread. Uh, and in fact, this is where they held the fire and on what you don't see in the picture, just off the right side of the, the photo, there's a gas station and a few houses just on the other side of the road. And, and uh, you know, again, the firefighters were able to control the fire uh, at, at the spot. So uh, the point I want to make is this is forest management in action. It works. As a society, we should be doing more of it, not less of it. Wood from trees is the most renewable and sustainable resource on the planet. We should be using more of it, not less of it. So managed forests in our area support a health, healthy environment, a healthy economy, and healthy citizens. And we look forward to continuing this tradition for another 100 years, 109 years. Uh, this is just our piece of the puzzle, and I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, from the other pieces of the puzzle. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. Uh, hey, I have one question that came in that I think is <clears throat> timely in nature to ask you. It was, how much of IEP products are exported to international markets versus killed here locally? The vast majority of our products are shipped uh, here in the uh, Western United States. A few of them uh, make it over to the Eastern United States and a very, very, very small amount makes it into Canada and Mexico and, and virtually none makes it over overseas. It's a very, very small percentage. All right. Awesome. Thank you. And, and a reminder to the audience with us today, uh, we have the Q&A function open. Uh, we'll try and provide written answers as they come up, but we will have a full Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So please do queue up your questions, throw them in there. Uh, we'll make sure we answer them before the end of the program today. Uh, next up, I'd like to welcome Russ Vaughan, founder and CEO of Vaughan Timbers. Uh, Russ, thank you for joining us today, and we will jump into your presentation. Thanks, Lance. Uh, hear me okay there? Yep, sounds good. Great. 
Uh, that looks like the end slide for my presentation. But, uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to follow Paul. Um, I uh, affectionately know him as Buck because I happen to have some close connections with uh, his college days. So uh, always good to hear from him and IEP. Um, Boggan Timbers, uh, for those that don't know, um, is a manufacturing company located up in Colville, about an hour, hour and 15 minutes north of Spokane on Highway 395. Um, we manufacture products from all the uh, local and regional forests here, and uh, not to be confused with Boggan Brothers Lumber, which is uh, a company that I was vice president of for 15 years. Um, where that's an actual sawmill where that uh, specializes in small diameter logs and um, takes the, the trees that IEP and others produce, they're four and a half to 12 inch in diameter size and produce dimensional lumber. Um, when I looked at uh, cross laminated timber and glue lamb beams, I felt like that kind of helped us complete the circle of value for the forest products that um, we were making at the sawmill. And uh, after discussions with my family, it was um, the best course of action was to start a separate new company and utilize those products that are produced at the mill. So when we say from forest to frame, um, what we're doing is we're taking those products that come from the forest, they go to the mill, we then um, bring them over in the form of two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, up to two by twelves, um, but mainly two by fours and two by sixes. So small diameter uh, trees make up the, the products that we produce. And then we use um, uh, adhesives and put them together to make large panels and, and glue lamb beams. And we're building in a new way that uh, hasn't been seen much in North America yet, but is uh, vastly growing and is something that's happened uh, in Europe over the last um, two decades. So Lance, if you wanna to go to the next slide, I'll take you uh, through a um, kind of a journey here, a sequential process, we'll go pretty quickly. Uh, Paul mentioned the era of mega fires. Um, there's been a lot of talk about fires and rightfully so over the last decade as they've increased. And the conventional wisdom or the, how would I put it, the, the mainstream likes to say that it's all about climate change. And although that pay, uh, plays a big role in it, um, it has far more to do with the simplicity of fuels. And when I say fuels, burnable materials in the forest, um, there's three legs to uh, the fire pyramid. Um, you've got an ignition source, um, you've got uh, fuel and you've got oxygen. Uh, the one thing we can control is fuel. And we have in particular on our federal lands, um, we've essentially stopped managing uh, actively on our 193 million acres of forest service land. And there's also, uh, I think it's, 225 million acres of uh, Bureau of Land Management, which is part of the Department of Interior. Um, we've just, we've gone from a regular management protocol that probably needed to be revised because it was a little aggressive um, to essentially stopping and just fighting fires. Uh, what that's done is it's built fuels in the forest to create an unhealthy and unnatural condition. And if you go to the next slide there, Lance, um, the, uh, this is a, an image of um, a Vaughan Brothers forester, Josh Anderson, in the aftermath of a fire um, on uh, the Kettle Crest in between Stevens and, and Ferry County. And uh, the sad part about this particular fire is that we had worked with the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition, which is a group of environmentalists, um, local businesses, and interested people in what's going on with the forests, uh, in particular on the Colville National Forest, to work out new management um, protocols that get approved and collaborated on by the environmental community so that we get the social license to manage our federal lands. And this particular site uh, had been approved and was set to um, 
to go out as a stewardship project in October of 2015. And in August of 2015, a fire ignited and torched the whole thing. So instead of a healthy forest, uh, we ended up with this. And if you look at the ground there, um, you can really see uh, this burned incredibly hot and is very destructive to the land and makes the land very unproductive because what happens in a forest is all of the needles and other woody debris that falls down uh, creates uh, essentially fertilizer for soil and builds soil. And when we have these fires, um, it, it basically destroys all that and sets back hundreds of years of, of uh, slow soil building over time. So um, if you go to the next slide, Lance. Uh, the, the, this is a, the kind of the alternate route. And this is where the forests have been thinned to maintain a natural range of variability. And basically that means the, the type of forest that would have naturally been in this part of the world. This is on the banks of Lake Roosevelt, just, uh, just on the uh, Eastern edge of Ferry County, um, north of the Colville Indian Reservation. And you see a lot of Ponderosa pine. There's, if you look closely, you can see some fir in there, but um, primarily this is a place that was naturally op had open spaces. And when fire did come through here, which we do get natural fire, it burnt the undergrowth and kept the large spacing. And a lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of tree species are fire resistant. Um, and Ponderosa pine is one of them, Western larch is another one, where they're designed to uh, operate in an ecosystem that has fire every 10 to 15 years, uh, sometimes longer intervals, but there, those trees typically survive. There's very little mortality in a natural fire regime. Right now, we're, it, it used to be catastrophic wildfire in, uh, and we know this from research, was approximately 20% of all the fires. It's now over 80% of all the fires. And that can be directly attributed to the amount of vegetation that's burnable or fuel on those fires. Okay, so you can go to the next one, Lance. So what do we do to help combat this? Um, and, and I'm not suggesting that climate change isn't real and that carbon pollution isn't a problem. In fact, I believe that if that is a core belief, then wildfire is the number one uh, thing that we should be working on because we can um, make a big impact very quickly. Uh, the carbon emissions from wildfire uh, very quickly, uh, many times um, dwarf the, uh, the emissions of the transportation sector and the industrial sector. Um, there was a stat in British Columbia, Canada, that in 2015, over the course of four weeks of wildfire, that their um, carbon emissions uh, was four times that of the transportation sector of the whole province because of the wildfires. So this is a serious uh, issue. And we have some real serious solutions. Um, the crane up in the upper left-hand corner is uh, at Vaughan Brothers Lumber. And you can see all those small logs there in those piles. Those piles then, as you go to the um, upper right-hand corner, get cut into um, solid sawn lumber that has to be further processed to become a, a finished product that can be used either to uh, frame a home or to build the products we make at Bog and Timbers. Um, and this is where the circular economy kicks in. So IEP manages forest land, provides logs and sells them to Bog and Brothers Lumber. We then buy the, that lumber and produce the, the products in the bottom. And uh, the product in the bottom left is cross laminated timber. Uh, Bog and Timbers produces a four foot wide up to 60 foot long um, CLT product. And then to the right, we also produce glue lamb beams and glue laminated timber panels that um, go to a, a further digital fabrication process. And in the distance there, you can see our CNC machine that allows us to do precision cutting. Because you can imagine with these large panels, uh, doing field cutting um, is not a real viable um, option and it's not real accurate. So we can go to the next one. So I'm going to go through some of the things that we do 
uh, inside our facility. Um, so this is for a project that we did locally in Colville with um, a local dental insurance office. Uh, it was a 22,000 square foot project. Um, they, they wanted a special coating going on the CLT to make it uh, a little less um, reddish because it was uh, uh, Douglas fir larch, which has a reddish tone to it, very rich kind of warm feel. Um, but because it was an office, they wanted it to be a little bit more um, white and bright. So we put a coating on there. So it still gives the rich um, variation of color that fur provides, but it mutes the tones and turned out really well. I uh, can go to the next slide. And, and I just point out that project, that 22,000 square feet um, with our contractor, we were able to set that project in four business days. So that was, it's, and that was included all of the glue lamb beam uh, cross members. We put all the, uh, the, the specialty cuts and connections on to put those together. Um, so that's, that's a part of this process that not a lot of people understand is there's this custom fabrication and hardware assembly that's done in the factory. So when um, construction companies like Baker Construction pick these products up, they go straight into uh, their destination rather than having to be constructed. They're in many cases assembled on site. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, give you an idea of some of the, the products and the way things can be used. There's really a, a limitless number of options. Um, we have certain certifications that are industry standard and those give you numbers in terms of span tables and other things that you would need to build with. But we also produce things that are um, that are custom. So if you look at the bottom or the, the, the image on the left, that's our CNC operating station, our uh, computer numeric control system that allows us to do all the precision cutting. Uh, we made that operating station uh, out of some of the leftover panels that we had from a project and it turned out really nice and is very functional. Um, the image on the bottom right is that's now um, that's become a sound um, wall at a little kind of makeshift auditorium in Twisp, Washington. So if you're ever pulling into Twisp, you'll see this uh, little development called Twisp Works. And this is where that's located. Um, there's a few other of our products there, but basically what we did is uh, it looks like at first glance that those are pieces of lumber that are different sizes, but they were actually um, we use the CNC to cut those at, at uh, precision lengths to create that, uh, that specific pattern based on what the customer wanted so that it would reflect the sound appropriately at their sound stage. So uh, that was a solid piece that we actually precision uh, build that size. Yes, yeah, so, uh, just a couple other images and we'll go through quickly. Custom staircases. Uh, this one turned out really well. It's at the University of Oregon. Um, and then we also have the, uh, the, the way that we put the panels up on our CNC. So a lot of times we'll produce a bunch of panels and then get the, the cutting specs and put them on the CNC and do those very rapidly. Uh, go ahead and apply. You go to the next slide, Lance. I don't know if my connection's working properly here. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, sorry about that delay there. Uh, this shows the samples we send out to architects, developers, engineers. Um, this particular uh, image has glue lamb and CLT product that we stamp and then we send out. And we also apply some stains to them so the customers can see different colorations and what they might be able to um, uh, use in their projects. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, this starts to show how these products go together. This is a, a project where we did the, the custom fabrication. Um, 
and the CLT. So you can see there's a combination of a steel, steel substructure, uh, there's a concrete foundation, and then there's glue lamb um, used for columns, and then glue lamb beams used for the support structure. And then the CLT is used as a floor system in this case. It can be used in many different ways, but this is probably the most commonly used because people already uh, that, are, that are in construction already know this kind of process of post and beam and then um, floor systems. The, the CLT, um, those panels can be placed um, and two minutes per panel, maybe three, depending on the size of the pick. So you can do entire floors in a number of hours, which is pretty impressive. Could go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, this will tie into the pro the the uh, presentation you'll hear shortly. Uh, this is some construction shots of the blockhouse project uh, in Spokane. Um, and what I wanted to show here is just the the amount of solid wood, how it plays together, and then the shot on the right um, kind of shows you how the panels go together. And so in this case, we did uh, multiple story panels in a vertical assembly and then used some in the horizontal to create some of the openings for the best, most efficient use of material. So we didn't have to cut a whole lot out. So we're using, um, it's creating very little waste, almost no waste on the job site. And if any of you have been on a, uh, a wood frame job site, there's always wood waste because you get piles of material that you need to cut up and put into um, a specific size. These pieces have already been um, cut to size and openings have been cut. So it's very efficient and precision on the job site. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is a, a finished shot of the Blockhouse project and how that can transform a space in relatively short order. Um, I won't spend much time on this because you'll hear from Andy and Quinn coming up, but we can go to the next slide. Uh, and then here's a, a, a 3D image. Um, we spent a lot of time in 3D software creating things. This is a, a collaboration that uh, Andy Barrett is leading for the Matt's House uh, or Matt's uh, Place Foundation. Um, and this is going to be a structure, a house for um, ALS patients that um, you know have really been dealt a, a tough hand. And so, Many times, just a regular ADA uh, setup structure doesn't cover it for people that have to be in a motorized chair and need help, um, you know, just doing daily activities. So uh, this is a cause that, that Andy's very passionate about. He involved uh, myself and, and Baker and a number of other folks. Uh, Miller Hull Architecture uh, donated their time to help make this all happen. Um, so this is in the early stages, but I think that this image also shows how different the product is. So this is going to be constructed in a, in a couple of days uh, because all of those pieces are pre-cut and ready to go. Um, and then the finished work is where the, the time will, will be taken. And it'll, it'll take a few more weeks to get things uh, put together and, and finished up. But as far as getting dried in so you can do those other um, activities. It's, it's pretty, pretty quick. Next slide, please. Um, and I also, before uh, wrapping it up here, I wanted to show some of the larger uh, projects that we're doing. This project is, uh, the roof is topping out this week. This is Oregon State University's Cascade Campus. It's a new campus in Bend, Oregon. Um, there's going to be 36 campus buildings. This is uh, building number two. Um, and we're grateful to be a part of that with companies like Swinnerton. Um, SRG is the architect on this. And uh, you know, another group that, that uh, deserves a lot of mention whose office in Spokane has been a leader in mass timber is DCI Engineering. Um, they're, they're vastly or quickly becoming the, the leader in mass timber engineering. And uh, I think that is the last slide in my presentation. So I'd be happy to, at the end, answer any questions and I'll, uh, I'll go through the Q&A here. It looks like a couple of questions popped up during my presentation. Uh, last thing I'd really, I'd say just to wrap up is how beautiful uh, the circular economy is developing here in, uh, in Eastern Washington. 
um, to have companies like IEP, Vaughan Brothers Lumber, uh, Vaughan Timbers, and then be able to add value to what were just a traditional commodity um, product, and then to work with the likes of Baker Construction, Andy Barrett and the Blockhouse Life Project and others to uh, unlock that value and keep that here. And then when we are sending the materials out, rather than just a two by four, or two by six to the market, um, we're sending out precision cut value added products that have the value that can really be shipped all over the world. And we're just really excited to be part of that. So thanks for the opportunity, Lance, and we'll let you have it from there. Awesome, thank you, Russ. And uh, again, thank you. You'll tackle some of those questions that came in. Uh, in the Q&A. And again, a reminder to the audience, you can throw your questions in Q&A and we'll get to those as well as have some time at the end here. Uh, at this time, uh, we're going to shift over. We've got a short video giving you a tease of what the beginning of the Blockhouse project looked like here. And then we're going to welcome uh, Quinn Holt from Baker Construction and Development Inc. onto the mic here. So give me just a sec while I queue up this video. Uh, if we do run into some choppiness on the video, we will be sending links to view the videos um, from a streaming ability from your own computer here uh, following the event. So bear with us. Uh, we hope this runs smooth, but technology and, and whatnot in 2020, uh, we'll just blame it on the year and call it good. So hang in for just a second. All right, Lance, can you hear me? We can, I'll turn it over to you there. All right, uh, my name is Quinn Holt. Uh, I'm a project manager at Baker Construction. Uh, a little background on me, I've been here about uh, five or six years. Um, I graduated from WSU in 2015 and started full-time uh, working for Baker. Um, we were fortunate enough to be hired on by Andy and uh, Cody Combs to, to build this project. Uh, I see a Go Cougs, yeah, Go Cougs. Um, so um, today I'm gonna talk to you guys about how that process looked um, from, from our side, taking the panels from um, logging timbers and, and putting, them, putting them into what you see there. So we can go ahead and get started. Next slide. So yeah, summary of topics, so we'll talk about quickly the process of, of what we went through, talk about a few challenges that we faced, um, then kind of what the future looks like with us and, and CLT and um, how we can be better on the next one. So yeah, go ahead. So the, the image on the left, so that's a, that's a site plan that we started with. Um, so it was about a half acre site and we put eight total buildings on there. Um, some of those buildings, are about eight feet apart and about 24 feet tall. Um, so, and uh, you can kind of see on that picture too, there's some there's some trees that Andy and uh, Cody were very adamant about keeping, even though we tried to convince them not to. Um, but at, in the end, we're glad we did. It, it makes it look so much better, but definitely added some extra challenge in building this, so. 
Next slide. So um, on the left, so each of, the, each of these block houses has these pier foundations. Um, they don't look that big in this picture, but um, some of those are four feet wide and eight feet deep. Um, and on, on top of those piers uh, um, is a steel I-beam frame. And then we do a, a wood deck, a wood joists. And then we also stub the utilities into the middle of those buildings and uh, drop in what's called a smart wall, which we'll, we'll talk about here in, a, here in a little bit. So we get the frame done, um, get everything ready. And then uh, that picture on the left is the CLT panel. So that's, a, that's one complete building from Bog and Timbers. So each of those panels, uh, Russ was showing earlier those shop drawings that, we, that we're working off of. Um, each of those panels has a specific number and location. Um, and we worked with them to, to make sure that they're stacked on the, on the truck in the order that uh, we wanted to take them off and install them. So quite a bit of coordination. Um, in that middle picture, just want to show an example of how we how we pick them up. So there's a, a big screw that goes into the top of them, and then we use what's called a, it's called a hornet. Um, you pick those up with a crane and lift them into place. Um, that picture on the right was the first building that we started putting up, and of course the first building that we put up uh, it started snowing. It was the first snow of the year that day, so that was awesome. <laughs> so next slide. So that picture on the left, so that's a, a building um, almost complete with the CLT walls. Um, Russ talked about it a little bit earlier, but that, that middle picture shows how these are all connected. That's called a spline connection. Um, the floors and the roof were on this one were supported by that uh, steel angle that you can kind of see on that, on that right picture. And then that's a, a smart wall put in place with uh, the kitchen on one side and uh, the bathroom on the other. So, and this first building took us about two weeks to put up 10 working days. Um, by the last building, we were getting, getting them up in two days. So um, definitely a learning curve to this, but uh, I think we, we got it definitely figured out towards the end, so. So I spoke earlier about the, the smart walls. So these were coming through, or coming from uh, Vestas, so. These walls have all the rough end done for the kitchens and the bathrooms. So you can kind of see there, you got the plumbing piping, the venting, you got the toilet carrier, um, electrical panels, it's all, it's all roughed in when it shows up to the job site. Um, and then in that picture on the right, uh, you can kind of see it on that video that we showed earlier, but those are getting dropped into place. Um, so obviously you got to get those in before you get your roof on. Um, and with those and, and the panels, I would say went very well. Um, they all they all fit into place correctly and seem to seem to go really smooth. So next slide. So the exterior envelope. So um, this was probably the most labor intensive portion of the project. Um, the CLT panels when they go up, it's it's quick. It's great. Um, and then kind of everything after it on, on this project specifically, we tried to do everything in the field um, and it just took, took a very long time. It was very um, expensive and it, and it just took, took a while. So on the left there, you got uh, comfort board insulation um, in between some Z furring, which is basically metal studs. Um, and then you got your wood nailers and then we got reclaimed wood siding. And then there's a mixture of heavy gauge metal panels and then some hardy panel as well. So pretty much every every kind of material you could think of was on the exterior there. So yeah, this this part took a long time on this one. So hopefully in the next one we can get these um, some of the stuff done in the factory, which will which Andy will talk about. So next phase. So yeah, after we get uh, everything buttoned up on the exterior, um, we move on to the interiors. We seal the walls, um, make everything look good, put the trim in, put the doors, flooring, um, and then those uh, kitchens as well. They're kind of micro units. So you got a washer and dryer, a stove, small fridge, uh, water heater, uh, microwave. So all of your plumbing is right on that wall. Um, and then, yeah, finish out the interiors and bathrooms. So. 
it all at the end of the day it all turns out really really awesome it looks looks amazing so next next slide so biggest challenges that that we faced um first of all just working through permitting and inspections um, it's always important to know with a new product it's it's not uh, um, it's not just the builders that are are new to working with this it's the it's the cities it's the inspection departments um, so we ran into a lot of delays there um, which is understandable but i think moving forward it, it'll go a lot quicker um, attempting to build the normal way with 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 the clt so um, getting the buildings up and then kind of doing everything after um, kind of how you would normally do a construction, a normal wood frame job. Um, I think moving forward, we're going to try to get as much of that exterior done um, before it shows up. And as you can see, I mean, the buildings are really close together. Um, we got to go really high to get, get the siding on. So trying to do all that in the field, um, especially in the winter, gets, gets very difficult. Um, and then everything was pretty much custom after, after the panels. Um, after the panels and the smart walls. So a lot of field installed items that hopefully we can kind of move backwards into, into the, the factory moving forward. A um, little bit of cart before the horse on this one. I think we were all very excited. We thought we knew it. We were all geared to go. Um, I think part of that was we didn't really know what, what questions would be asked that needed to be asked on, on this first one. Um, but moving forward, I think I think we know a lot better how, how to do these. So um, a lot more collaboration is happening on, on the next one. So, so moving forward, um, I talked about it, just, just that collaboration. Um, with CLT, it, it requires a lot of coordination, which is a, which I think is an, an advantage to using the product. Because um, we're talking about projects that are happening a year from now, and we're already already mean we've been meeting for for months so it requires collaboration by everyone um, which makes the impact on the site a lot less um, and then the also, also the nice thing about clt if we can get to that next phase with getting that envelope on and getting the buildings on prior to um, them showing up is we can get the majority of the site work we can get the paving we can get the concrete we can get uh, majority of the site done by the time they show up. So once they show up, we get them buttoned up and then uh, turn over the keys. So that's how that's how Block House went. Um, it was it was a lot of fun, definitely a learning experience for us. Um, but yeah, it was great. Looking forward to the next one. Awesome. Thanks, Quinn. Uh, we've got uh, one question in the uh, Q&A that you can probably tackle as we pivot over and introduce Andy here. Uh, I want to get us moving forward. So uh, thank you. And uh, next up, we've got Andy Barrett. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Andy. Thank you, Lance. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, perfect. All right, my name is uh, Andy Barrett. Uh, I'm involved with a few different manufacturing companies here in Spokane, uh, Berg Companies for 26 years, this block house project, uh, uh, I operate out of the toolbox up uh, north of uh, Gonzaga, uh, involved with Vestas. And as uh, Russ said, uh, Matt's Place is uh, my a nonprofit that I work with. So um, I'd like a quick shout out to um, Quinn and his team at Baker. It took a bunch of young bucks to tackle something so different and new, and they did a great job. Uh, also out to uh, Russ, who uh, we've been working on CLT and Blockhouse for about five years now, maybe six. Uh, I wouldn't know a, what a panel of CLT looked like if you hit me over the head with it uh, six years ago, but uh, he's definitely got me uh, drinking the timber uh, Kool-Aid, so to speak. Um, so what I wanna do is just spend a little bit of time, and I know we're kind of running short on time, but a little bit of time on Berg companies coming from a manufacturer standpoint and producing complete shelter solutions um, to uh, to where we got to the Blockhouse project and, and a little bit about that journey. But first, uh, I'd like to play a, a video that really, really shows what Berg does. Um, 
So if uh, Lance, if you could tee that up for me. Everybody here knows that it's about the warfighter. We know that folks that are using our products aren't in the best conditions. They're the warfighter. They're out there in the conditions. It might be raining, it might be cold, it might be really, really hot. There is no Home Depots, no Lowe's out there in the theater. We know that when they're out there, they have to have everything that they need on hand. We focus primarily on DOD, starting off with the Army, but all facets of the military. And our focus is uh, the camps, the premier camps, original all camps. So if somebody comes to us and they want a camp, we can provide everything that goes into it. Basically a one-stop shop. And then when it's delivered to them, it's ready to go and ready to set up. So people have came to us and said, could you make this into a hospital? And we have. Could you make a talk out of this? Yes, and we have. Could you make a latrine or a billet or a admin, yes, yes, and yes. And we have integrated hundreds of different styles of shelters, literally, for the military and other DOD. A lot of the equipment that we have here, we've built ourselves specifically for the purpose that it's needed, because it's unique. We brought manufacturing in-house and did the full gamut of manufacturing from bend and break metal to making hinges to making our own bunk beds. So when people called us, they said they knew that they could get an answer quickly that was their solution they were looking for. Some of the equipment we use, especially for, we see in the flow lines, that everything flows down the line and it's easy to track as it's going from station to station. We have a lot of quality checks in the process. We make sure that everything is done correctly. Even simple things like having the bunk bed, the top bunk dropped by three inches so a short guy like myself can reach down and plug his iPhone in. Simple innovations like that that seem trite are a big deal to the warfighter. But coming to a small company, the, the first thing you notice is decisions happen quickly. And I always tell the folks here that they have come from large companies that it's like driving an aircraft carrier. And if you realize, boy, you should have went that way, you talk to the navigator and within about three or four hours, you'll start going that way. As a small company, we're like in a little fishing boat. And if we decide we need to go that way, I push the motor and in two seconds, we're going that way. We're very veteran oriented. About a third of our workforce or so is either retired vets and or active in the reserve. We'll continue to remind ourselves that that's our mission is to make sure that there's troop comfort for our folks in the field. We all understand that if we have to work long days or long hours or we have to retest or we have to re-engineer, we all know that it needs to get done because somebody in theater is waiting for it. And when we hear stories when they come back, and somebody says, yes, my son or my daughter or myself slept in one of your shelters or used one of your latrines, that's a big deal to us. It's gratifying to know that they used them, they liked them, it makes you proud of the products you build. Uh, thank you, Lance. So as you can see, uh, you know, we produce complete uh, shelter solutions and our, uh, our, our, our passion with the Blockhouse Life Project was all about how to take what we've developed at Berg and produce an affordable housing solution, something that is, that is green, that is micro units, it's affordable, uh, that we can contribute to urban, urban infill. And that was that was our Blockhouse uh, 1.0. Um, like Quinn said, we, we learned a lot about that um, on that project. Um, we're currently looking for a unique site for our 2.0 project. As Quinn said, we will be bringing walls out that already have the siding and insulation on them. The, the power will already be run through them. The windows and doors will be uh, put in them and we'll also uh, are developing a, a full bathroom pod with a kitchen on the back side. So we can really take a lot of those trades um, out of the field and into the factory where it's always 72 degrees and sunny. Um, so I guess with that said, I have one more video because I know we only have uh, 15 minutes left. I have one more video I'd like to show a little bit more about the finished product. Hi, my name is Jake. Oh, yep. Why don't we go ahead and play that, Lance, and then I'll finish up.
Hi, my name is Jake. I will be your host here at Blockhouse Live. So let's go ahead and check it out. So all of our units are made in a sustainable manner with modular design, utilizing CLT and reclaimed and repurposed wood. So here at Blockhouse Life, we have a mix of long and short-term rentals. So right here is one of our short-term rentals, the Pacific Micro Studios. So we'll just go ahead and take a look at one of these. Each unit has its individual smart keypad code. So you'll get the code sent to you prior to your stay. They are each 240 square feet. All of them come fully furnished with every single amenity that you might need. It also comes with a queen size Murphy bed that is memory foam and actually super, super comfortable. And then if you take a look over here, we have our kitchenette. And no, you're not gonna be cooking any Thanksgiving dinners in here, but we do have plenty of options for cooking. We have, you know, coffee machine, laundry and dryer combo, and yeah, has everything that you might need for a short-term stay. So the cool thing here at Blockhouse Life with its modular design is that it utilizes CLT, or cross-laminated timber, as you can see with the exposed wood here. And this is actually sourced from Colville, Washington, just about an hour north, and it leads to forest restoration efforts in the area. Through this little hallway here, we're gonna go ahead and check out the bathroom. For the size of these units, the bathroom actually feels very, very spacious. As you can see, it's about nine and a half foot ceilings. It has really everything you need, every little creature comfort that you'd expect to find at home. All right, so here at Blockhouse Life, we had an actually really, really cool and unique partnership with Avista, the city's power provider. So the brewery over here on the top of its roof has all solar panels that provide power to the whole entire Blockhouse Life complex which makes it so we're near net zero energy consumption. So as you can see, everything here at Blockhouse Life is focused on sustainable living. So we have some alternative forms of transportation here, such as the ride sharing station, our e-bikes to go ahead and check out the local area, or we're just steps away from public transit as well. So that is Blockhouse Life. We are super excited to share the sustainable lifestyle with you. So the next time that you're in Spokane, make sure to check us out. So uh, some of our units are in long-term rentals, some are in short-term rentals. Uh, I, I like to call it flex-term uh, re rentals. So people can come for a day, they can come for a week, a month, a year. There are, if you stay for a year, there are no utility bills. Uh, we, do, we are supposed to be producing more power than we consume. Um, it really is a net zero affordable housing uh, solution that happens to be very biophilic. Uh, one fun fact I'll share with you is uh, that reclaimed siding um, came out of a building, these red fur uh, beams um, out of a building that was produced in 1899. And then we had it milled down for the siding um, and we counted the rings and uh, those trees started growing here in 15 and 1600s. So uh, talk about some, some reclaim wood. Um, the other thing I'll mention is uh, Paul and Russ brought up the circular uh, economy. Uh, I feel like uh, Blockhouse is just expanding that circular economy also and keeping uh, out of our woods um, into Russ's uh, mills and into uh, uh, his CLT plant and then down to our facilities where we can value add and uh, quickly put these up. So. Anyhow, uh, that's what I have. So I guess we could open it up to questions, Lance. Thanks, Andy. And I'll invite the rest of the panelists to uh, throw your video back on here. Uh, we do have some time for some q and I had a couple come in uh, that I wanted to tee up uh, right off the bat. Um, you know, one of those being um, when, we, when we talk about how we can utilize CLT and, and how it can assist with, with both urban infill and maybe ADUs. Maybe you can talk through what, what an ADU is uh, for those that aren't up on the acronyms here. Uh, give, some, give some insight into that. Yeah, sure, Lance. Um, so an ADU, attached dwelling unit, uh, or a detached dwelling unit um, is um, encouraged by most cities uh, through the permitting process uh, allowed in most cities. And it's where you can put 
uh, a living unit in your backyard, if you will, uh, just trying to increase that urban density. Uh, we are seeing a lot of different companies uh, building a modular solution um, for that and uh, an obvious solution would be a blockhouse type product. We have not done one yet. We are uh, eyeing a couple spots in the Spokane Mar and Coeur d'Alene market uh, to build our first one of those. Very cool. Um, and then another question was, uh, maybe Quinn, you could tackle this one. Are there are there elements and methods that were used in in this um, construction and uh, assembly technique that um, normally you might say, you know, what elements had you used before that were, were in, put into play for this type of dwelling? I'm curious, did you learn anything doing this new type of construction uh, that you're going to carry forward into more traditional uh, builds? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, I talked about it earlier, but um, the amount of dialogue that, that we're having with, um, with the project teams before the project happens and during and, and even after, um, I think has made us much better at other types of construction because it's, uh, it's required us to critical, critical think and uh, think through problems a little bit more than maybe, maybe we would have before. So I don't know if there's anything specific, but I think as a whole, um, just that critical thinking aspect of uh, planning ahead has made us made us better as a company. Uh, Lance, yeah, Lance, go ahead. I'd love to chime in if I could on that as well. Uh, from a from a uh, a manufacturer's perspective, doing this blockhouse 1.0 was uh, extremely uh, frustrating. Uh, with just like Quinn said, the lack of detail, the the start and stops that go along with that terribly inefficient and, and, and that lead time is very long. So I think in, in 2.0 and, and what Quinn's alluding to is what we really need is we need those, those detailed drawings from that, that marry into what Russ is cutting up in Colville, that what, where the electrical is run to how that is attached. Um, so I think that detail or, you know, that building modeling, uh, uh, Revit, if you will, uh, is critical to uh, future projects. Gotcha. Uh, Paul and Russ, a question came in here. Um, if you can talk about, uh, we've talked about, you know, preserving the land and, and making it uh, more efficient, but uh, maybe just the concept of what is the value the land has, uh, that of the land that's left that isn't managed right now and maybe that future uh, forest opportunity uh, there. Yeah, I can tackle that first, um, Lance, and let Paul <clears throat> wrap it up. But you know, essentially, what we're focusing on is how do we keep these forests in a healthy condition? And instead of focusing on what we extract from the forests, um, focusing on the rest of the time. What do the forests look like when they're not being harvested? And what we found in particular on federal lands, um, by approaching that one, we get the support of the environmental community to do that kind of, of work where we're thinning forests appropriately using science-based methods to do so, but also leaving behind a healthy forest that people can enjoy, recreate, in particular on these public lands that people are using, um, that there's a bunch of different values associated with that land. And we actually think um, that the logs in that particular case is a byproduct of creating healthy forests. And the actual product is the forests um, themselves being in a healthy condition where they're resilient to wildfire, um, where they can be used for recreation and other purposes. And then while we're doing that, we're creating the kind of byproducts that um, build projects like Blockhouse Life and some of the other larger commercial projects that um, wood traditionally hasn't been the centerpiece of, but now is a incredible eco-friendly and energy efficient alternative to um, what we've been using in the past. Am I, am, we am I on? 
Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Uh, I, I uh, totally agree with uh, what what Russ said, and and uh, the uh, you know the whole value of the forest is all of these values put together. It's it's not just uh, it's not just logs anymore. Uh, it is uh, recreation, and there's the social value of having green spaces and, and whatnot. Um, to pivot just a little bit, one of the tools uh, that we can preserve the value that you know this this whole value of the forests are conservation easements, where um, you essentially get a tax break for um, the development value, and so you can continue to operate a uh, a working forest and retain those other values. It's just, and it will continue on into the future um, uh, as, a, as a forest. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I saw that question in the um, comments there. I think, um, I believe Andy uh, might have uh, thrown an answer in there, but maybe one that we, we give, or Russ said a little bit there, but has there been research into that CLT use and, and for uh, remodeling or making additions to existing homes and then any plans for uh, building freestanding modular single family homes with the product? Yeah, I'm sorry. As Go far, ahead, Russ. As far as uh, remodels and additions, um, in Europe, you're seeing a lot of traditional uh, construction with modular units going on top, for instance. And Andy and I have talked uh, about, especially in these urban centers where they have schools that are bursting at the seams and they don't have any more land. How do we create modular classrooms that are, you know, when you're considering steel and concrete, these wood structures are lightweight, but they're very high performance. They could be lifted onto the roof of an existing school if it has the structure to support it or build the structure uh, to add things on like that. So yeah, there's been some, some thought and some discussion on it. And then in certain parts of the world, there's been some actual um, growth along that way. And then the Andy and I worked on a project a number of years ago that was, uh, it was a school project in the state of Washington that um, uh, was just that. It was a uh, a classroom addition. So instead of at adding these portable classrooms, um, it was actually an addition made of mass timber that essentially attached right to the school and then they clad it the same. So it looks like the school and it just, it was able to uh, quickly add uh, a structural addition and then finish out the details to add classrooms. So that can be done um, on a small or large scale residentially as well. And we have a number of projects that are custom homes and um, a, a lot of requests. Uh, you know, Blockhouse and, and the, the projects that Andy's working on are probably the most advanced at this stage that we've worked with, but we get people all the time in different, with different ideas on how they wanna take the repeatability of mass timber and make it modular. Um, you know, from as small as saunas to, you know, as big as, um, you know, multifamily units that can be repeated in a modular format. So, um, yeah, it's happening quickly. Some of it's research, some of it's happening in real life. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I, I would echo that. I feel like if I was a student and I had the opportunity to go to class inside a, a mass timber uh, space versus a modular uh, unit. I, I mean, hands down, like, let's, <laughs> let's go. That's a, that's an awesome upgrade for sure. So um, I want to thank you all, uh, Paul, Quinn, and Russ, and Andy for your time and, and lending your expertise to uh, tell this story and, and hopefully inspire some ideas uh, throughout our community. Uh, additionally, I want to take a moment to thank uh, our chamber team. Uh, they put in a lot of work day in, day out to bring programming forward to the community uh, in a virtual capacity this year. Uh, we're, we're hopeful that we can get back to face-to-face -face here uh, sooner than later, but in the interim, uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Uh, and then again, thank you without the help of our sponsors and our members. So our sponsors today, BNSF, Ide Bailey, uh, Modern Electric, 
and Spokane Community College for your support of this program. Uh, truly grateful for that partnership to bring this content forward. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you have additional questions, uh, feel free to reach out to the chamber at info at spokanevalleychamber.org. We'll make sure we can connect you with any of our presenters uh, to get that feedback uh, for you. And aside from that, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, uh, have a wonderful uh, voting uh, day here coming up. Make sure you get your ballots in and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. So thank you again uh, for joining us. We are adjourned.